All right, friends, well, it looks like we have our recording all set up and ready to go. I want to make sure that we did that for those who are not able to be with us today. Uh, I want to first start out by thanking you all for being here today and thanking our Ezra team uh, for the work that they have done so far. The work of discernment and vision work um, is, is not for the faint of heart, and it's certainly not for uh, some people's personalities. A lot of folks love to uh, kind of go and do and uh, building relationships and uh, a lot of the visioning work is kind of sitting and having conversations, talking a little bit about uh, some uh, theory and understanding and kind of the, the big picture of, of church work that is uh, really, really important and I think helps us come to understand how we can uh, think of this community as working together. Uh, but I will admit it's not nearly as fun as a water day where you get to jump down the water slide and, and play with water balloons and that sort of thing. So I, I really appreciate you being here. Um, this is a very important conversation, and this is certainly not the end of the conversation. Uh, we wanted to at least start here with a chance to get some feedback, get some questions, share a little bit of the behind the scenes and kind of some of the, the, the heart of what we're really trying to do here. I mentioned earlier I shared the uh, public Ezra team update that's been out for a couple of weeks publicly available. Uh, I'll reference that in just a minute a, a little bit, but before I do that, um, I want to mention real quick, uh, if you're on the Ezra team, would you just stand up real quick? So we've got Andrew and Linda and Colleen and Edith Serrano is sort of an honorary member of the Ezra team. She comes in, uh, to occasional meetings here and there. Uh, let's see, uh, Elaine Bowman and Jennifer Hartman. And uh, Ryan is also, I guess he was already standing. So Ryan is one of the team as well. Uh, and Connie. Uh, did I miss anybody else? Okay. Uh, that is the, the full uh, Ezra team. Um, I want to make sure that you know that this group has dedicated uh, two meetings a month. That's uh, two evenings, plus some readings and um, watching some videos, doing a little research, making phone calls, uh, a lot of different stuff in between our meetings. So it's a very dedicated group who really cares about the life and future of this church. And I'm really thankful again for all their dedication and all that they have done to get us to at least this point in the conversation. Uh, and now we're going to start to think a little bit more practically and trying to understand uh, what the sort of big picture stuff means. So we're going to focus a little bit right now on, on the big picture. Uh, I'm going to invite two of our Ezra team members to share their heart and what they feel about uh, the work we've so far. But I want to just give you a couple of quick specifics to make sure we're all on the same page uh, about what we're talking about today. Uh, the Ezra team was chosen a, a long time ago, really based on kind of three interrelated criteria and then a, a very essential fourth. Um, the interrelated criteria, and I'm going to grab my notes because I'm prone to forget things sometimes, uh, were a deep and committed faith. So we wanted people who were uh, evidence that they had a real deep heart for Christ and a deep faith that challenged them to uh, engage with the community, to engage with the work of the church. We were looking for a commitment to and relationships with this congregation. So it was especially important to us to uh, find people who knew the heart of this congregation, who knew many of you who were on the table who were not on the extra team, who knew the history, who knew the really important stuff that this congregation had done, uh, and who worked with this congregation, who were dedicated maybe on a committee, several of our staff members are on, uh, but really wanted to make sure that people knew uh, and could be a, a good representative of the heart of this congregation and its history. Uh, we also wanted to have a diversity of viewpoints, so part of that means uh, some of our folks are very dedicated members of this church, but they've only been here for a year or so. Uh, some of them are you know, multi-generational families who've been here forever. Uh, but we wanted to at least have some who were younger, some who were older, some who were uh, in Sunday school classes, some who were not, some who were with youth, some, uh, just all this sort of various viewpoints to do our best to represent uh, the full diversity of opinions and approaches of this congregation as best we could within an uh, eight-member team. Uh, and then finally, the, the fourth uh, criteria that was really essential was people who are open to something new. Uh, people who are willing to go into a conversation with very few assumptions about what should be the outcome of this, to really try and capture the heart of this congregation, to understand its history and what it has meant to people in this church and this community, and then begin to open our minds to how that might look going forward, to lay that foundation for the future of what God is going to do here, so we can build on that legacy rather than simply make one little tweak over here or a tweak over there, but really try and think about what this church looks like at its most effective, building on the legacy of what we've always been, but for a future that we know continues to change. So that's what really brought this group together. Um, out of that idea, out of that conversation, came this idea of food, family, and faith, that really important framework that I think shares what the church is, what it's doing, or what it's doing, what it's doing its best, 
meeting basic needs, that build relationships, that reflect God's love for us. Uh, from there, we talked a little bit about um, some priorities and trying to kind of, uh, as we viewed our history, try to understand some important themes to uh, how we can approach any practical uh, uh, thing that we come up with. Those priorities are listed in your uh, public update. It shares a lot of the kind of background to that, uh, something of a definition of it, some challenges that we face that we're trying to address. Uh, some leg the legacy and some of the positives from our past that we're trying to build on. Uh, but what those three things are, are uh, to empower and equip far more than authorize and do. Uh, I mentioned that earlier in the service as well. Uh, really thinking about how we can empower and equip you all to do the work that you feel called to do, that you're excited about, that you're passionate about. Most of the great things in the church, in every church I've been a part of, happen because somebody has a passion about it. Not because the pastor gets up and says, here's the perfect solution to this problem, here's what you're going to do, and what you're going to do, and, uh, dictates how that goes, but really try to think about how do we empower and equip better so that more of those things uh, can happen that really change lives. The second is simplify what must be done so that we can focus on the purpose that gives life. That's really kind of the two sides of the same coin. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff that sort of has to get done in order to run the church. We want to simplify that as much as possible so we can focus on the stuff that we really enjoy, whether that's a, a water day or whether that's a, a trip to see the painted churches or whether that's a you know, domino day or a food giveaway or uh, whatever those specific things are that really give life and joy. Simplify everything else so that we can focus as much of our effort as possible on actually building relationships and actually finding joy and hope in those events. And then finally, intentional growth with eyes wide open. Uh, growth is never easy. We want to acknowledge that up front. Even if it's the best and most perfect kind of growth, when you get married and get to meet your in-laws, um, that doesn't always go well whenever you don't have exactly the same traditions and exactly the same expectations. Uh, even the best of growth, the best of times when the family grows, it can be hard. And we want to acknowledge that up front and think about how we can best uh, approach growth and doing new things in a way that honors the past, that honors the people who are here, and that actually welcomes people in. Rather than saying, here's our box if you want to come play in it, say, our life is better and more of God's children are around the table. So how can we maximize that kind of growth and that kind of approach? So that's the overall uh, and some of the overall themes, kind of how we got to this place. I want to invite Andrew to come up. He's going to share a little bit about uh, how he thinks about this sort of conversation and the work of the Esther team. Uh, come up as soon as Andrew is done. I'll share one more comment and then uh, invite some questions. Oh, and I should tell you about, uh, we're going to close out at 12.30 no matter what. Uh, we may get done closer to 12, depending on how the conversation goes. But uh, one more time, thank you for being here. Here's Andrew. Okay, folks, um, I've, read, I've written something. I promise I won't read it verbatim. Um, let me preface this by saying, if this sounds like a testimony, it kind of is, um, because I think what Stephanie and I have experienced here over the last year or so is really a kind of a good reflection of what this church is meant to be, is, and can be. Um, Connecting kind of where who we are uh, locally and um, in the wider scope, macroscopically, um, with where where we're supposed to go. I think, um, like like Pastor Jeremy said, we've been um, trying to discern um, where this where we're meant to be, what we're meant to do as a church. In a sense, we're we're talking about our calling as a congregation. Um, and for those of you, know, several of us in this room can. Can uh, attest to how complicated that discernment process is, and possibly it never ends. Anyway, um, this place, as I'm sure we all know, is a place of, of welcome um, and renewal. Um, Stephanie and I can attest to that personally. Um, we were out of the church for a long time um, for various reasons, and we started looking for a place, and we found this, a small church, and I'm glad we found a small church. Uh, we, uh, we deliberately avoided the big churches. Uh, we were living in Stafford at the time, um, and there is a great big uh, Baptist church right across the highway from us, uh, where we were living in Stafford. We could have gone to Sugar Creek, but then we would disappear into a mega church, and who wants that? Anyway, um, we've only been Methodists for a little while, and I've been spending, I've spent a lot of that time since we decided to become Methodists, trying to just figure out, what does that mean? I've had lots of conversations with Pastor Jeremy, I've read some books, and one of the things that I learned is that the Methodist Church has a history 
of discipleship, evangelism, of practical charity, and vital piety. Um, uh, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, and their co-laborers noticed in the early part of the 18th century that there were a whole bunch of people who were going to church who were spiritually dead, and a whole bunch of folks in Britain who would never go anywhere, anywhere near a church. So they decided to try to live a life of holiness based on the Bible. Somebody else at some point called them Methodists and the term stuck. Anyway, so this is our history. This is our heritage. We, are, we grow out of that tradition. So if we find in ourselves in a place where a, in, a, in a church that needs to renew itself, the good news is that's literally our history as a people. We already have the tools back in our own history. Um, and it goes even farther back than that. Um, Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. The men he was talking to, the disciples, became the apostles. The apostles handed down the faith that we affirmed in the service just a few minutes ago. Um, and it goes on from there. Um, now I have to look at this. Yes, sir. Um, Jesus, Jesus also said, the, the, the field is ripe unto harvest. Pray for God to send laborers into the field. And I think we're planted smack in the middle of one. We have a lot of the same problems in this in our society today that Wesley and his co-laborers had back then. An effectively unchurched society. People lost, so lost they don't know they're lost. Desperately needing to hear hope and life and peace. And as much as we don't need to have the attitude, we have the answers and here you take them. It's our calling um, as Wesleyans. It's our calling as Christians, as, as inheritors of the apostolic faith, to go. But that doesn't mean we have to leave behind what we are. Uh, we don't have to be stop being a, a, a little church where everyone can know everyone else. We don't have to stop being a church where families grow up in the faith together. Um, that's another one of the things I had to get, I've had to get used to as someone who used to be Baptist. Uh, infant baptism doesn't make sense to Baptists. I'm just going to tell you that. Um, but rethinking things like the sacraments has really helped me understand what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be claimed by God. And the fact that we baptize our children before they can make a decision for themselves, get, bringing them into the family, into the church, that tells me something important about what we believe about what the faith is. Uh, so we don't have to stop being Methodists to go out on mission. Um, I think by going out on mission, we become more truly Methodist than we have been. Um, which is not to say, I'm not trying to cast any aspersions on what was here in the past. Um, there's a history case in the other building. We have a couple of... Um, of cornerstones in the back room of the agave shop. We're planted here. We know we're meant to be here. Um, I think, I, I understand we tried to move once, and it, it, or we tried to expand once, and it didn't quite work. I think that's a pretty clear indication that we're meant to be right here. Um, so, now, the question is, how does that work with going to all the world? Well, we happen to be on the doorstep of Houston, Texas. Um, Nigeria, India, Vietnam, China, they're all downstream and around the corner. Um, so I think, and, and this is what excites me about what we've been doing as the Ezra team, what gives me hope for this church and its future, is that we're not stuck in the middle of the last century, where going to church, and sitting in a pew, and being on a roll was all it meant. We've learned the world needs more. The church needs more. We are meant for more. So we can go to the ends of the earth without ever leaving the county. <laughs> um, I think we have we, we found our place, and all we need to do is hear the call and grow into it.
in my class as to uh, where we're going and what makes me hopeful. I asked Andrew, did I have my notes too? It has been um, really exciting to spend two nights a month um, with this particular group. As uh, Jeremy talked about, it's a group of people who, some of whom have very deep roots in this congregation, generational roots, and some of us like Andrew and myself who are both very new here. And so it's exciting to put our heads together and to pray and to discern together. And I learned, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot about the history of this church. And as a newcomer, maybe some of you don't know this, I, next week will be our second, we will have been here for two years in the in Rosenberg area. And we found this church, we moved in July and we landed here in October for the first time, had a little hiatus and then we're back for Advent. And you really haven't gotten rid of us since then. <laughs> Advent of 2019. Of course, we haven't spent a lot of time together though because in the middle, there was all of the, the COVID. So um, it has been really exciting to, to join this team to learn more about my own community and learn more about uh, this church and our potential role in this community, kind of who we've been um, and who we can be. So I'm really excited about having a plan. I feel like um, the pandemic was a, um, gave us a choice to either sit back um, with our arms folded and just kind of live into a new reality of watching church on TV. Um, but it also gave us the option of trying to figure out who we did want to be when we came back. I think we would do ourselves a disservice if we thought we could just come back um, and not do things differently, right? It was a real opportunity to dig deep and see what our gifts are and then how best to utilize those in God's service in this community to join what God is already doing. It's not like God's not here. God's always been here. So we're discerning kind of how we meet uh, where God is. So I'm really proud of us for not deciding just to kind of die a slow death. I mean, we're probably in decline based upon everything that I've heard about the history of the church. There are fewer people now than there were, but that doesn't have to continue to be our narrative. And so I feel like we're choosing a different path, choosing a different narrative. It may not look the same. Church may never look the same as it did, but that's okay. That can be a gift. And so I think that's what I'm most hopeful about is as we um, kind of broaden the conversation beyond the Ezra team and into the admin council and into the larger church, starting with you all today, um, just kind of how much bigger that dream uh, becomes when other people are going to join in the conversation. Um, let's see, I'm hopeful because of the formation that I feel like we're receiving, both when I watch from home as well as when we gather here. I feel like um, what we're hearing in worship, Jeremy's sermons are just, he paid me a lot to say this. <laughs> I forgot this is online. <laughs> Worldview of uh, 
we, most of us look a whole lot alike, um, and we come from a church tradition that um, kind of has always done things in a certain way. And that's not necessarily um, who we're going to find on the outside, who's looking for church. So um, I think that we can, we still have a lot of room to grow there. And that's hopeful too, really. It's a concern, but it's, it's a hopeful one that um, as we examine ourselves individually and have the opportunity to, to do that in small groups as well, that we'll be better prepared to share what we have and to be open to the different methods and modes and uh, worldviews that we'll have, uh, that we'll be needing. I don't have a very, I, I hear a lot of people um, kind of out in the, not this community necessarily, but just in general, our culture has a very dismal outlook about um, non, or unchurched or, or the nuns um, and about young people these days. And I, don't, I just don't share those dismal outlooks. I think it's, um, a, we have a right opportunity to speak um, life and love into um, a culture that needs more life and love and messages of hope and joy. And so I'm really excited to figure out how we best do that in this, this reality. So I think we're called upon to be creative. So that's my concern. We're all going to put on our creative hats and figure out uh, the best way to do church in a way that we haven't done before. And so as we develop cultural humility and com uh, competency, I, I just I hope that we can remember that we don't have to have all the answers. We're not being called upon to have the answer to church. We're being called upon to share what we have. And perhaps church is a more mutual idea of just taking the best of all of us and the best of those who will come and worshiping God. Because what more? We're created to do that, right? Thank you. Any of the other SUT members want to say anything? Linda, good. Tony, Ryan? Okay. I'm going to give you an opportunity. You don't have to take it. That's okay. Um, let me say real quick the uh, questions that Larissa mentioned, um, I think I'll repeat this off the top of my head, uh, were what are you excited about regarding the Ezra Team's conversations? Uh, what concerns you regarding them? Uh, what gives you hope? And then what, what else do you want the congregation to know about what the Ezra Team is doing? Uh, I'm going to ask, that there, I'll uh, hand you a link and we'll put it on the website and everything as well after this meeting. Uh, but I'm going to ask you basically the same questions. What are you excited about, about this conversation, what we talked about today? Uh, what are you concerned about regarding the possible implications of what we're doing and talking about here? Uh, what gives you hope about the church's future and the ways that we can be more faithful? Uh, and then finally, what do you want the Ezra team to know? Uh, just anything else that you want the Ezra team to know. Um, I, I think that those are really important questions. So that's going to be the, the survey that you're asked to fill out later. Uh, obviously, any sort of other questions you want to ask or things you want to talk to me about, I'm always open to receiving that sort of feedback and having those conversations. Um, before I take a moment for a question and answer, I want to just uh, take us all the way back to the very, very beginning uh, of how we got here. And I really want to try to think about, um, real quick, about why we're even bothering to have these sorts of conversations. Uh, because when I got here at the end of January, or I think February 1 was my start date in 2020. Um, and, and when I got here, it was already very apparent that something had to give. Uh, if you look at our church's historical numbers in terms of worship attendance and uh, budgetary giving, the, the, age of, or the age of the membership, the numbers who were attending Sunday school, all, all these sorts of numbers, uh, many of those numbers have declined by 30 or 40 percent, maybe even a little bit more over the last decade or so. And so there wasn't really a scenario in which we could simply do nothing and hope for the best and then expect anything great to come from that. And so even before the pandemic hit, I already started asking questions. I wanted to know, what do you want to do about this? There was no secret that we needed to do something. And so there are basically two options for the business idea of this. Uh, this. You can either uh, raise your income, which means getting new members, getting new programs, getting new people in the door to help bring in more donations and more sources of revenue. Or you can cut your expenses, which means uh, cutting down on electricity, selling off property, uh, firing staff, whatever, uh, those, those sorts of things that you might have, might have to do. Uh, so I laid it out on the table and I asked every church leader, every uh, committee people that I talked with, that question said, what do you want to do for the future? What are the one or two steps you want to take? 
And it was pretty resounding that the answer was, we want to do something new and exciting, something that matters in our future. What we don't want to do is simply die a slow death. We don't want to just kind of close our doors or risk not being able to pay the bills next week. We want to take a, take a stab at doing something meaningful and important. And that was very clearly expressed. There's actually the, the original spreadsheet, the answers that I got as part of our uh, meeting notes, as part of the, uh, one of the links that you can find, uh, the top step priorities or something like that, uh, in one of the first links and the uh, date that I handed to you. That was really the, the clear uh, desire of this congregation from top to bottom. Nobody said they wanted to just kind of slowly cut back and kind of, you know, ease things off and, and just kind of be what we are right now. Uh, we, we want to see new life and possibility for the future. And so, to be really blunt, uh, the reason we're having this conversation is because we're in a situation where we had to do something, we had to start some sort of conversation. Uh, where we are right now, let's be really clear, uh, we're in a good place financially because of some help from payroll protection loans and uh, some really incredible generosity over the last year and a half while I've been here. That's not something that can last. Uh, if you wanted to know uh, just a, a basic number that would make me comfortable for next year's budget, uh, I would say if we could, if we could either raise $80,000 more or cut $80,000 in expenses, then we'd be totally sustainable and not have to worry. There's a whole lot between here and there. We can uh, do some creative things with uh, how we uh, fund and how we pay for certain things and uh, reaching out and some, some stuff that we can cut back on. Uh, but we're not, it's, it's not sort of a, a one simple step thing to be able to stabilize uh, and then figure out what happens for our future. I think this is a really good opportunity for us to do something significant so we can see what sustainable future God has in store for us. And that's really the, the scene and at the heart of these Ezra team conversations is saying, we don't want to just do nothing or have no conversation now and then just kind of hope for a miracle that uh, may turn things around or may not. We want to do everything we can to listen for the voice of God and figure out how we can most faithfully take a step forward now and boldly follow where God is leading us. So that's why we're having these conversations. It's not something I take lightly. It's not something that um, I think that we can uh, set aside and sort of wait another decade or so and just kind of see how things go. Uh, this is our chance to either take a bold step forward in faith and see what God will do, uh, or to really start cutting back and making sure that we get to a sustainable place uh, when we are better. So uh, I'm really thankful again for the conversations we've had so far, for that willingness to take a clean slate and think, what is really the heart of our history? part of our legacy, the, the thing that has really changed lives, and how can we preach that unchanging gospel to a rapidly changing world? How can we do it in the way that our neighbors can hear, that this world can hear, so that we can see that do something incredible into our future. So that's where we are right now. Um, I want to pause here and, and invite some question and answer. So Ezra team folks, if you're willing to come up here, I've got three chairs. I would love for not me to have to talk most of the, or answer most of these questions, because it matters much more what you're hearing and thinking and whatnot. Um, can have more chairs and more y'all in the corner here. Uh, all right, sorry. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, please, folks, uh, I'll walk this one around and answer a question if I need to. But what thoughts or questions do you have, those who are not on the answer team? Yes. One of the thoughts that I have, I don't know how long I've taught a Sunday school class, but I think it's coming right up on 20 years, at least 15, in the literature is vibrant and so much better than anything we've ever seen. You can ask anybody in our class. We've averaged 15 to 18 every week because we also allow Zoom. We meet, we do a Zoom meeting for Sunday school. And so I'm just very impressed with what Coach Berry is producing and the importance that they're putting on faith in Jesus and how we reach out to other people. Forgiveness of our own sins, that type of so it's been a good, for me, this last year, it's been for a while. Thanks, sure. Any other comments or questions based on what's been said so far? It's on your hearts and minds today. I'm uh, hesitant, but I'm going to stick my neck out. I have noticed uh, a lot of comments about change. And I'm very grateful to hear that. I humbly feel as though I've gone through a lot of changes in this past year. And I need to learn more. That is the biggest change that I have seen. Uh, as a volunteer for the Red Cross, our region is 40% Caucasian. 
So the majority of the people in this region don't look like me. I have found that I am very blessed. I had a lot of privileges so many people don't have. And I really feel like what was said this morning is great, is involving other partners to work together with us. I'm wanting to know what people have to say and what you think about what I'm saying. That's what I found in the question. Can I add one more thing? Sure. <clears throat> when we started changing the worship services, the question came up um, about communion. Will we going to stop having communion because of the rules for the wearing the mask and all of that? And our Sunday school class discussed it, and we made the decision to deliver communion the homes of the shut-ins, anybody that can't come to church because of pre-existing health conditions. And we started that immediately, and we haven't missed a Sunday since, Andrew, um, delivering to shut-ins and some of these, I see as many as 18 on a Saturday morning before we take communion on Sunday. And they are so appreciative. I mean, I, do, I can't tell you how much it has meant to them that First United Methodist Church, not me moving out to speak to them, but First United Methodist Church coming to their homes and offering them the communion elements, which they'll take later with the church service. But it's just been very reassuring. We're getting out there. <laughs> That's a good thing. Sure. And I'll just pause real quickly to say that's a great example of the kind of thing I talked about uh, related to the women's brunch earlier in the service, where uh, it wasn't some sort of uh, wonderfully, beautifully thought out program of the pastor that said, here, won't you take communion to people? Somebody came to me and said, I really care about our people. I want to make sure they get communion. Can I take it to them? And I said, absolutely. We'll find a way to make whatever I have to do to make that happen. Uh, you, you tell me what kind of role I need to play here. And I think so many of the really beautiful things that have happened in this church happen just like that. Again, where somebody gets a passion, they decide that they want to make a difference for people in our community, for people beyond the walls of our church, uh, for whoever it is. Uh, and they get that idea, they get that passion, and they find a way to run with it. And a big part of what our, our conversations have been, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, I mean, how do we think of ourselves in that way first? How do we think of ourselves not as a sort of a bureaucracy that has very clear policies and procedures that, uh, you know, you have to go to the right committee to be able to kind of pitch your idea and you know, take a six-month process to develop this idea of taking communion to people or whatever it may be, but uh, how do we already have the assumptions in place, the, the principles and policies in place, or when somebody gets an idea that says, this is how I think God is calling me to fulfill this mission, 99% of the work is already done, so they can just say, the church is going to say, yes, I can do this, and then it's maybe as simple as just doing a calendar request for coming. Um, it's, it's that sort of thinking that we're focused on. How do we set ourselves up in a way so that we can develop these passions, uh, see the ways that we can be faithful, uh, not so much any particular in program or event, but how do we think of ourselves as the church that can plant these seeds of inspiration and then see God do incredible things on the other side. That's just a great example of how that has happened already where uh, they got an idea and they made it happen and I'm really excited to, to see it happen. Any other comments? Yes, and they, they make bread every month. <laughs> Lovely bread. Tastes great too. Around us is 40% vocation. 
Um, if I remember correctly, the, one of the, uh, a bishop from another conference here in Texas uh, gave a, a, a talk at the annual conference the other day, Bishop Saints, Saints. Um, he said something that, that, that uh, the U.S. The as a whole is something like 96% white. Uh, so we, we might have some adjustment to do. Um, I talked about renewal. Um, one of the things that I have been discovering over the last year or so, I've, I've effectively been rediscovering church as a whole. Um, and one of the things I've learned is how big and how old and how diverse it is. Um, the prayers we pray uh, through the course of the year were written all around the world uh, from going back to the first century. We, we, pray, we, we pray prayers written by um, Asians and Africans and, and Europeans who spoke something that we wouldn't even recognize as English. So when we look at that diversity and wonder how do we adapt to this, I think what we're really Another way to think of that is not as a problem, but as an opportunity. Um, stepping into a wider church, the, the church of every tribe and tongue and nation. Um, the, uh, the, the, the church, I think, is growing like wildfire in China. Um, the parts of the United Methodist Church which are growing like wildfire are doing so, I think, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, where, where the need is dire and the, uh, the worship is joyful. Um, and they look nothing like us, but we all have the same heart because we all worship the same Lord. Um, we say every Sunday, I believe in the communion of saints. All we're really talking about, reaching out to this wider world right around our, our, ourselves, is living into that affirmation of faith. Okay. <laughs> Sure this one works. Yes, it does. Uh, I'll just real briefly say uh, one of the uh, things in the packet of information that you'll see if you do all the research is that uh, our neighborhood, if you do a two mile radius around this church, it's actually 64% Hispanic. Uh, I think it's 10 to 15% white, and then a variety of other uh, minorities represented in the rest of those uh, percentages. Uh, so that's uh, it's just a, a very clear reality that if this location is a big part of why we are planted here. That's part of our focus for the future. Uh, we don't, we're not gonna radically change and turn things upside down overnight, uh, but we at least have to recognize that, that pull for diversity, that pull for uh, the Hispanic population especially, but also the, the other minority populations, is gonna be a part of our future. And what that looks like and how, we, how that plays out uh, can go 150 different ways easily. Uh, but we can't ignore the reality that the two mile radius is what it is. So where we were planted, uh, is a significant factor in what we do from here. We have to be able to recognize that reality and lean into it rather than simply uh, pretend like it doesn't exist. So, uh, any other comments or questions real quick? Yes. Oh, yes. What you just said, this is all on. Yes, I just turned it back on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what you just said is um, how diverse the community around us is. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is how open-minded we're going to be to a variety of cultures. How open-minded are we going to be if their worship style is different than ours? I mean, I know it was hard enough for some churches just to go to contemporary music. Oh my gosh, you're changing the church. How are we going to handle changing our church to meet the needs of other cultures? You have to ask yourself. Can you allow somebody on the same pew to worship different than you? Can you allow a person to sit next to you to raise their hand when they're praising God and singing without going, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs>
some Mexican music. I, I forget where it was, but you know, if you know Don, you know Don breaks into dance. <laughs> Just call him here. Yeah. <laughs> he loves to dance. And we were in some lovely place, and I forget where it was. <laughs> what did you say? The Gringos. The Gringos. Yeah, probably the Gringos. Anyway, Don started dancing on the way out, and you know, people are and laughing. What are you going to do if somebody starts dancing in the aisles here? That's okay. Just saying. And I want y'all to know I was thinking when we first moved in. I'll probably dance a little better than we have. Yeah, something I noticed like uh, watching the YouTube. Have you been to the YouTube and watched other churches? Have you done that? Other churches? You will notice that they have a lot more people than us. It's, it's the, uh, like, uh, most of them, like, they do contemporary music. They're dancing, singing, and uh, I think, uh, you know, it's one of the things that might help us if you want to add more people here and invite more people. But uh, I'm not sure about that, because if you like traditional, then it's not going to work. One thing I will touch on, to just in light of this real quick, is that um, my first appointment out of seminary was at St. Paul's in the Museum District. Uh, it was a really interesting church, and I'm really glad that I went there first, because it's uh, kind of the Gothic cathedral style. It's like, a, like Notre Dame or like a, a Duke Chapel. Uh, really just a, a fabulously uh, amazing building. And that partly defines what they do in worship, because they, they like chant the Psalms in Latin. I think Ryan would just love this place. Um, with all the, the uh, how traditional they are, uh, but it's also one of the churches that has the youngest uh, the youngest demographic in our annual conference. Uh, so it's one of the really cool things that I learned that it, it's very easy to think it's just the type of music that you do, or it's just this one little program, one little thing that can really be the thing that solves everything. And to Rudy's point, there there are, there's a crowd, there are people who respond very clearly to contemporary music. There's also some young folks, there's also some community folks who would respond very well to the traditional service or to uh, some of that, that more ritualistic kind of uh, rigid service that, that doesn't necessarily wave their hands as much. And so what, what I, the reason I say that is because I don't want us to think that uh, the, the key solution is to just do contemporary music instead of traditional music. It's never, you know, never that simple. And that's not what we're talking about doing with the Ezra team is kind of making that sort of concrete change. What we're talking about is setting ourselves up so that we can be open to whatever it is that God teaches us to do, however those encounters happen, whether it's uh, at a water day where we're realizing that we're not actually all that different, even though we may, uh, our lives may look different from the surface, we're actually not all that different. And when you have those kind of encounters, when you have those sorts of conversations, that's when God really gets to work and helps us to understand how we can build our life together and what we can do. And that may very well look a lot more traditional, it may look like doing two separate worship services, it may look like a lot of different things, but I just want you to hear very clearly that we're not talking about one specific change as though that's going to magically fix all our problems. We're talking about thinking of what our purpose is, what our, what our kind of that core, why, why do we exist as a church, and how do we take the core of that unchanging gospel and preach it in such a way that an ever-changing world can actually hear it. And when that happens, we begin to make those decisions that actually do practically affect things. But we're not going to make them now before we know who it is that we're encountering, before we know what our congregation begins to look like, because we want to make sure that for as long as possible we're open to whatever sort of practical solution that might look like. Because right now it's so important is to see what God is calling us to do and how God is calling us to approach this work of church. Any uh, final thoughts or questions real quick? And I want to share one other thing. Okay, uh, so as I said, these are kind of the overall themes, kind of what has brought us, uh, was sort of uh, how we're approaching our work is looking at this idea of food, family, faith, thinking about uh, how can we be a, a missional church, a church that's engaged with our neighborhood, a church that certainly focuses a lot on uh, actual hands-on mission projects, hands-on things where we encounter people, uh, work to uh, find the gifts that we each have and bring those to light. Uh, one of the <clears throat> practical things that we want to look at doing uh, right now, and this is something that we're going to make a, a sort of semi-formal recommendation to the Ad Council to explore, uh, is to think about our church leadership structure uh, and how that might, uh, how might shift that in order to more faithfully and more effectively do this kind of work. Um, one of the things that we did, Ryan, can I grab this sheet of paper real quick? 
Uh, the, the, the big one. The, the, yeah, yeah, that one. Probably easier to show this even than just talk about it. But um, this is, uh, I forgot to say earlier, um, the binders over here are the uh, Ezra team meeting notes. It's all the notes and the resources that we've looked at over the course of the year. The big sheets of paper are a couple of exercises we did trying to think about uh, that really uh, values and structure, kind of thinking about what it is that uh, that really means so much to us and, and helps us to take steps forward in our faith, uh, and also how we think of ourselves as a church and how we structure the work of the life of the church. Uh, what I've got right here is was a simple exercise we did to try to think about our actual leadership, and this is part of what uh, that uh, a long time ago I shared that what do we actually do survey with you all. Uh, I also took our uh, church conference documents where we kind of officially nominate our church leadership for the year uh, and a few other things, and I just made little cards to show what it is that we actually do. And then I challenged our group to put it on the wall, to, to just kind of show the structure of what it is that we actually do, how do these things uh, relate to each other, what does it all mean together, uh, what is it that we actually do, and kind of look at it in this sort of format. Um, there's a, a big blue circle over, over here. Um, you can look at this closer, though. I'll put it back over here so you can take a look at it. And it's also uh, in the, all the links that, you'll, that we'll share with you if you want to look at it when you get home. Uh, but in the big, big blue circle, it's basically all of our staff members. Uh, the, there's a couple of other specific tasks underneath, like a worship leader, the playing music and worship is underneath that. Uh, so a few things like that in this blue circle over here. Uh, the green circle just underneath my fingers at the top is our administrative committee work. Uh, that is trustees, lay leadership, uh, finance committee, the treasurer, SPRC, ad council chair, uh, lay leader. Uh, that's actually one card representing all nine members of our trustees, finance, and SPRC committees and lay leadership as well. Uh, so it's actually 36 people, or 36 cards, if you want to uh, be precise about it, represented within that uh, green circle. And then on the lower right, there is a, a big red circle, and that is basically everything else. Uh, so you have a prayer team, altar guild, worship chair, uh, mission, senior adults, we care, greeter, usher, summer camp liaison, all sorts of other stuff. Uh, and one of the things we notice that becomes very apparent whenever you lay it out like this is that there's not any real clear or necessary relationship between these three circles of things. It's not totally clear how any particular uh, activity or event to focus thing works with any particular staff member. It's not totally clear how the administrative structures of the church uh, interrelate with any particular uh, uh, staff member or uh, activity. Uh, it's clear that they're on top, that they're sort of the authoritative and kind of uh, 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 decision-making bodies of the church. But as far as how they exactly relate to the rest of the work of the church, it's not entirely clear. And I think if you look at our church history, uh, you can kind of see that play out in a lot of different ways because what we wind up doing most of the time, uh, somebody gets a great idea and we add it to this red circle over here. Uh, it's, it's lunches of love, it's the agape shop, it's the Bethlehem village, it's the... Um, some sort of trip that people take, it's some sort of program, whatever it might be. Uh, so we wind up just sort of adding every new thing over here to this red circle uh, without necessarily understanding exactly how it relates to anything else that was already going on, uh, how these activities, how these ideas uh, kind of feed into each other, um, how it all works together. And, and I think that, that creates a lot of challenges and, and, and it, uh, as we think about um, how we can uh, do a more effective and faithful version of, of church structure. What we really want to challenge us to think about it is to think about kind of the, the core purpose at the center, uh, the, the sort of idea of why we exist, to set up some, some policies, some procedures, uh, the decision-making body, the, the people who work to do that sort of that sort of work that uh, kind of puts the principles in place so that everybody else can do the work. So you can get, begin to see. Uh, well, and Brian, would you just go ahead and pull that up? It's probably easier. For me. Talk about the big one. The, yeah. Say, oh, let's take a. Oh yeah. Really cool. I feel like now, like, like ah, it hurts. Okay. Right, so, the, you, <laughs> <laughs> what you, what you're seeing there is uh, basically a set of concentric circles. And there's a whole lot more that goes into this. It's in the meeting notes. You can read a whole lot more about this. But for the sake of time, I'll just say. Um, what it represents is just an attempt to say, what is the core purpose out of which we operate, uh, and then what are the, some of the kind of key committees or the, the, the key uh, values, the key behaviors that we want everyone to, uh, to instill in everyone that are necessary uh, to do the work of the church, and then to lean into the fact that there's a whole lot of other stuff that's great and good and vibrant and important work to do. Uh, but 
once we start to lay it out like this, we can begin to see how some of these operate together. And so the, in, in the core, uh, what we tried to do is kind of take our current structure and just basically take the cards and map them over. Um, and it begins to show that it, it's not entirely clear exactly how uh, some of the, the work relates to each other. Uh, it's not clear necessarily how our uh, finance committee represents the, the core purpose and the base of the church. Sometimes that's more of a, 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 an outer sort of thing. It's, it's more of a task-oriented kind of thing. And so what we really want to do is think about how we can um, think of our, our leadership, our core administrative responsibilities, as, as setting the work of the church up in such a way that the, the things that truly matter can take place. And again, that's that principle. Simplify what has to be done so we can focus on the purpose that gives us life. Now, to do that doesn't require any particular strategy. There's about a thousand different ways that you can think about uh, setting up church leadership and structure. So what we're, we're going to encourage the administrative council to do is there's a book called Mission Possible. Uh, it focuses on what they call simplified accountability structure. Um, that's a kind of jargony word that basically means to uh, really think about um, who should be responsible for what and to set yourself up so that there's very clear uh, responsibility at different levels of, of the work of the church. And so uh, a big part of what we want to do with this is to uh, really think about how everything relates to one another so that all the little tasks, the things that we can do to, uh, whether that it is something like a, a, our, our METS program or whether that's our youth program or that's uh, a feeding program or a water day or whatnot, uh, set ourselves up in such a way so it's very clear how these relate to the other activities of the church. Is this a chance to, to meet our community members and to engage with somebody new? Is this a chance to go deeper in a small group and really get to know one another and try to work in the life of this church? Is this a chance to try and really invest and think about how we can take leadership and take ownership uh, of the work of the church? And how, how do these kind of steps um, work together so that what we're doing isn't just sort of tapping on one extra thing and turn it into the program category, but really thinking about ourselves, not sort of as a church that has a mission program that we tack on, uh, but how do we think of ourselves as God's mission that can then go out and do the really important work so that we can uh, simplify everything as much as possible and what we have to do, uh, and, and then really set ourselves up to plant the seeds of inspiration so that if somebody has an idea, they can go and run with it, and they can do whatever it is that God is calling them to do, and then we can figure out how to build on that and make these things work together uh, and maybe more. Uh, to be as faithful and effective as we possibly can. What are, are there any questions or thoughts you have on, uh, to, for clarity in what I'm saying right now? Okay, so I'm going to hand out this uh, little card. It has a, a link at the top, which I know you can't click on right now, but you can go to it if you want to do that. Just hand those out for me, thank you. Um, the bottom is going to be the actual recommendation that uh, we're going to make to the Administrative Council. Uh, so really what it is for today uh, is we're recommending the Ad Council make a task force so by the end of the year evaluate what it would look like to set ourselves up uh, in a more uh, simplified uh, leadership structure and to, uh, to think about how these uh, types of leadership relate to one another. Uh, I know that's a little bit jargony, a little, a little unclear, uh, but it really speaks to how uh, important I think it is that uh, Especially for a church that is uh, our size, that, is, that has as many people as we do. If you have to have 40 people to do the administrative work, uh, then by the time you filled all of those slots, there's not a whole lot of other people left uh, to do anything else. And so we want to make sure that we are maximizing our, our time and our efforts so that we uh, pick the right people around the right tables doing the right kind of work. And the better we can do that, I think the more, uh, the more we set ourselves up for success. Any, any thoughts or questions right now? Yeah. I think that last year the conference fed us on a daily, weekly basis what we could do and couldn't do, like canceling like you, like canceling BBS. That was after you know we already started planning and we couldn't do it because the conference said no, the risk was too great. So a lot of things last year were very different because we weren't accustomed to being told. We knew when the DS was coming, <laughs> you know, because we we just couldn't do anything to change it because of the pandemic. So that's what we did. We just had to cancel and not have it. But we had years when we had more than 100 kids participate in Bible school for five days, and then their parents show up for the final program that next Sunday. So we had some good.
good success with different nationalities and different people in the neighborhood. So we bought this last year was a great. And Vacation Bible School is a great example of a program that can be really effective at uh, getting to meet some new people, some people who may never walk through the doors of the church any other day of the year, but uh, just having that one little interaction can really go a long way to making a difference. Uh, and I guess maybe one of the quick things I want to say, just to, uh, I don't think I said this very clearly, um, what we're talking about with this, we really want to try to think about how what we do right now relates to one another. Uh, I'm not suggesting necessarily that anything that we currently do, any particular uh, usher, reader, or a task force, or we care team, or a or anything, I'm not saying that that goes away, but I'm saying think about very clearly uh, how that relates to the rest of the work that the church is doing, uh, so that we think about it more as, uh, as more as a connected and uh, kind of a process uh, of you know going from meeting somebody to engaging in maybe church membership to stepping up in leadership, um, or just simply meeting somebody like at a VBS for the very first time versus uh, taking another step in a small group versus taking another step uh, toward maybe you know, leading a project or doing something. Uh, there, there's certainly space for all of what is currently happening to continue to happen. Uh, and one of our clear priorities is before we would ever make any significant change, to go to every person who is on that leadership list who isn't doing anything and say either here's how your current task fits into this overall new setup, or to say I think what you actually like and what you're actually you know, gifted at uh, is over here rather than what we've asked you to do so far because I I won't name any names or anything, but I will tell you there's at least a few of you who have told me that uh, I do this committee work because I believe in serving my church. I'm not good at this. I don't really know what I'm doing. This is not what I'm passionate about, uh, but I do this because I believe that it's important for the church. And that's a beautiful and incredible sentiment. I'd much rather have everybody say that and say, this is what I'm passionate about. I can really see the difference that I'm making by what I'm doing. So that's really talking about setting ourselves up so that more people what they're actually passionate about, rather than simply kind of checking the box on a charge conference report, um, just because we, that's the way we've always done it. Questions, thoughts, concerns, hopes, fears, <laughs> joys, what else is there? You don't want to say anything? Twelve, twelve. I've given myself eighteen extra minutes uh, to finish. So we'll finish it a minute early, I guess. But I, I would really love to know. Just, uh, are you excited about this? <laughs> you, do you think you think we're onto something I here? Think yeah. Okay. Which direction I need to go? Yes. What is my part in it? Yeah. What's my part in it? But I'm sure I will figure that out eventually. Can you say more? Not. Uh, this is really about asking the right questions, about thinking through how, we're, how we set ourselves up. So that uh, I guess maybe I'll just say one other thing, a quick uh, example that uh, I'll give you kind of a quick preview that I was going to do in a week or two anyway. Um, through some of our actual Ezra team conversations, but not out of the Ezra team, uh, developed an idea for a Wednesday night thing that we're going to try out in the fall. Uh, we're going to pilot it on July the 28th. Is that right? Yeah. Wednesday, July the 28th, so mark that evening on your calendar. Um, Ryan just had this idea as we were talking about this idea of food, family, and faith. What represents the intersection of food, family, and faith better than a dinner where you have some sort of uh, faith talk and some sort of conversation around the table? Uh, and so out of that was born this idea of trying to do something new on Wednesday nights into the fall. Uh, like I said, we'll pilot it on July the 28th, I think September 9th or so is when we're actually going to start it. We'll hear more in the next uh, few weeks about it. Uh, but we'll have some music, we'll have a meal, we'll have an activity. It will be a, uh, much more conversational than a Sunday morning, but it will still have that sort of feel of I'm actually being enriched in faith, I'm learning something, I'm, I'm having a moment of worship with God. Uh, but really trying to take a moment to um, let that seed of inspiration uh, be born out and see what happens. So we're going to be very experimental about it in the fall. Uh, we're not saying exactly what has to happen, but um, really trying to see um, how we can open ourselves up to, to a new form of connection, that, that new form of, of worship. And so, again, it's not about the sort of like the little boxes that we're going to give you to say, you either fit in here or you don't, but it's setting ourselves up because that sort of conversation where we were talking about um, the new ways that God can move gave us a little seed of inspiration. 
uh, and then Ryan was able to take it and run with it. So I would love nothing more than to have no idea what any of you are going to do, but put you around the right table with the right people asking the right question, and then let God tell you what it is that you're going to do next. Because I think, again, I've said this many times, I'll say it many more, the best things that happen happen when God inspires each of us to lean into our passions, to lean into our gifts, and then to be open to what happens next. I don't have all the answers. I probably don't have any of the answers, if I'm being honest. But I know that it's so important to set ourselves up where God can speak to us in committing meetings even. So that what happens, the conversations around those tables actually change lives. Ryan, did you raise your hand? No. You look like you raised your hand and wanted to say something. Oh, no, I, I'm sorry. I thought you said who was you raised your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Are you able to raise both of them at the same time? No, I was just there was a discussion. <laughs> Anything, anything else? All right. Well, again, I thank you all for your time today. Thank you especially to the Ezra team for all your conversations. Uh, we'll bring this uh, sort of recommendation to the Ad Council. If you have questions about it or anything else at any time, let me know. Uh, we're going to, uh, there's a survey link on there. We're going to weekly email and on the website if you want to go. Give us your feedback through that or any other means. Uh, this is not the end of the conversation by any means, but it's really the start of trying to see what this looks like. To put it into practice, to set ourselves up so that into the next year and beyond, uh, we can be open to what God is going to do. All right. I'm going to offer a word of prayer and then we'll get out of here. That's right. God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the faithful legacy and the history of this church that has made us what we are and that has made it possible for us to have this conversation and figure out what it looks like to be faithful to you into the future. Help open our eyes to see you more clearly along this process. Help us to trust in you more and more each day so that we'd be able to let go of that sense of control and learn how much greater it is when we follow that uncontrollable spirit that you pour into our lives and throughout this world. And all things God, help us to be faithful to you, to follow you boldly, and to learn how to love one another more and more in all that is to come. We simply pray in Christ's living.